Hi, I'm John Idell, Pro Vice Chancellor for Health and Life Sciences here at the University of Bristol. Welcome to the next in our series of fireside conversations where I meet individuals working at the university who are leading the charge in research terms to address the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. The pandemic has had a profound effect on all of our lives. I speak to you from lockdown, the global economy has been affected, and many of us have seen our lives disrupted beyond recognition. This week, I want to explore the effect that the pandemic has had on education, and in particular, on higher education. In recent weeks and months, universities around the world, including Bristol, have worked incredibly hard to transition to online forms of teaching and learning. So what do educators at the centre of this transition think about the new pedagogical reality in which that they find themselves? What does it mean for the actual practice of teaching? And what comes next for education post-pandemic? To help answer these questions, I'm delighted this week to be joined by Richard Watermayer, who's Professor of Higher Education in the School of Education, and Sarah Davis, who's Director of Education Innovation at the Bristol Institute of Learning and Teaching. Welcome both of you and I'm delighted to see you both looking particularly well. So Richard, probably best to start with you, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about your background and about your recent research in this area? Thank you John, uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking with you and Sarah uh, today. Uh, so I'm, I'm a sociologist of uh, higher education uh, and curiously joined uh, the School of Education in March when, when all of this was starting to hit. Uh, and my interest and expertise, especially over the course of the last three years, has been in understanding transformations in higher education, specifically related to policy, but practice, and beginning to get into the mindset of academics uh, in terms of how we begin to respond to those challenges of transformation. And in terms of transformation, the, the likes of COVID has been extraordinary, both in terms of the extent of its speed and the ways in which it's changed our, our everyday lives and, and what we do as academics, uh, but also the extent to which this change could be seen to be not only just a, a temporary, but, but long-term aspect uh, impacting uh, what we do, both in the context of our teaching roles, but, but also significantly in terms of our research. Uh, and in that context, in terms of responding to what I found myself uh, amidst, um, was an opportunity to understand how academics across the world uh, were tackling uh, an emergency response to COVID, where university campuses were closing and where we were seeing an emergency uh, migration to online teaching, learning and assessment. Um, so with good colleagues at the uh, University of Swansea, we developed a, a survey that sought to understand academics preparedness, levels of competence, access, but also what our academic colleagues across the world were beginning to recognize as the impacts of the pandemic in terms of their practice. Uh, and what we found was, was a mixed bag, ostensibly. We found variation in, in the context across different country contexts of how higher education sectors uh, were being perceived by their academic workforce in the terms of their preparedness. I think most stark amongst that was the sense that the UK higher education sector was seen by our respondents to be quite significantly behind our neighbours both in Europe and the United States as another uh, um, major sample of respondents that we achieved. Worth noting at that point that we, we managed to get about 1400 responses from across 40 country contexts to the survey. Um, other things that, that may be not too surprising and, and which maybe many of our academic colleagues will uh, uh, register with was the extent to which a migration to the online teaching and learning context has, has brought with it significant intensification of our work uh, and also very much a blurring of our kind of professional and personal lives where the online uh, 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 move has meant that, that in a way we, we, we're, we're um, permanently on an online footing, we're permanently on, on digital on call. Uh, and a lot of our colleagues across the world talking of the extent to which they in part were struggling con to contend with uh, digital fatigue for one, 
but also for many academics with uh, parental responsibilities or uh, caring responsibilities for other dependents, uh, the extent to which they were managing both uh, home care responsibilities with the significant uh, and, especially, and essentially escalated demands of our students who themselves are, are, are now undertaking their work in for some a kind of foreign environment. And the extent of these changes in, in the context of thinking through the pastoral responsibility of academics, and not just the academic care, but, but the social and emotional care of our students. Uh, and I think this has also piqued my own interest and, and the interest of, of um, other academic colleagues in terms of now beginning to think through, uh, especially the mental health challenges that are um, especially becoming prevalent in a, in a COVID context and through the social isolation measures that it's precipitated, uh, to begin to understand both how academics in a pastoral role can support the mental health needs uh, of our students, but also ensure our own uh, mental welfare in these incredibly challenging times. Um, I think other aspects that, that have occurred and have been thrown up through the survey have, have been the, the um, fear of a move to digital online learning in, in the context of job obsolescence and the role in validation of many academics, where there is a, has been something of a, of a pushback against uh, digital technologies uh, where they are seen to be a threat to academic lives and livelihood. And also concerns related to digital technologies, perhaps dumbing down the pedagogies that we are able to offer in more traditional and physical forms uh, uh, and in-person forms of teaching and learning. Um, but needless to say, uh, where there is um, some element of, of doubt, anxiety, there are also uh, instances of people being able to uh, identify the affordances of uh, digital education and of the embracing of digital pedagogies. Uh, and what this may represent, especially in the context of an era of uh, profound uh, digital transformation and of digital disruption and what some refer to as this the time of the fourth industrial revolution. So in a sense, there may also be an opportunity here in the context of our rapid move to online forms of teaching and learning uh, for universities to move forward with their own uh, um, enhanced digital provision. Uh, so whilst I suppose that it's fair to say that the research so far has thrown up a lot in the, in the context of academic struggles, in the context of adapting to life uh, in, in, the, in the milieu of the COVID-19 pandemic, there are also hints of what might be achieved uh, and, and how the university itself might recalibrate, refocus, reimagine itself in a post-COVID context. Thanks. That, that was extraordinarily thorough um, and extremely helpful. I think it'd be quite useful now if we might could we we could bring sarah into the the conversation because you've described um a, a number of issues um that range from dealing with mental health challenges um a uh, feeling of potential obsolescence you referred to and of course i i think for many staff and and, and i've seen this in those that i've been working with over um the last few weeks those particularly with caring responsibilities those that are perhaps homeschooling children real challenges in the blurring of the boundaries bef between uh, professional life and, uh, and home life. Um, so, so Sarah, I'd be really interested to, 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 to know um, your thoughts on that uh, and those challenges um, and, and to tell us a little bit about your role and um, uh, how you see things developing um, uh, in, in this field. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, I was really uh, interested to, to see the outcomes of, of Richard's work. I think there were, based on what, you know, what I've seen happening from my perspective and from my prior work, I think there were definitely some surprises there, uh, but also some things that, uh, you know, I, I, would have, I would have expected to see. And I, I think um, in, in some ways I was surprised that uh, at the uh, relatively high proportion of, of staff from the findings I saw said that they were prepared. That's high compared to, for example, the kind of levels of digital preparedness that we were seeing in response to GIST national surveys of teaching staff. We, we, we see lower, lower percentages than, than half of teachers saying that they do feel uh, that they have, for example, weekly engagement in live teaching. It was, it's a, 
a tiny amount nationally. So um, I, I, it's not surprising that people didn't feel prepared. I think this issue of um, how much uh, kind of threat the, the transformation posed to people is a really interesting one. Um, you know, from I've done a lot of work over the years around things that you you may or may not choose to cause transformation, and it's quite a quite a significant thing how you present that kind of thing. There, there is normally universities have to be very careful about using words like that because it does imply that there's something wrong with what you're doing now if you're asking staff to transform. In in a time of of emergency measures and pandemics, it sort it de-risks innovation to a certain extent. I think there was a general feeling that it was so evident that, that staff needed to change. You, could, you couldn't carry on do what you, doing what you were doing before and that anything they were able to do would be welcomed both by the university and by their students. I think people were released from some of the normal worries about weighing what you could do up against what you've always done, that, that it kind of did unleash innovation. And, but I, so, um, and which is why I found it, a really important reminder, all those anxieties that, that your work, Richard, revealed among staff. And certainly we are seeing that, that now. Like I say, I think we saw less of it in that very immediate move to online. And more of it now, when we start to have conversations with staff about, so what are we doing in September? Um, that issue of all those things you've, you've mentioned about what is the right, what is the right online pedagogy for the kind of learning and teaching we do at the University of Bristol, for example? Uh, you know, when I was at JISC, I'd looked through a lot of the research on, you know, the effectiveness of online learning in terms of, you know, with so much input, do students generally achieve the same learning outcomes or better and that kind of thing. But a lot of the, you know, a lot of that data is from the US and, and in contexts that I don't think look that similar to UK higher education. And I think as we're talking to people now, we see that defining, I know everyone said defining a new normal, but defining how do we keep research informed teaching as part of that, that pedagogy? How do, what is the role of the, of the lecturer? I think as um, some of, some of, I think Richard, your, your wonky piece say that, that that some people feel that their their role has been downgraded in that in this you know people in in um, education technology often talk about the difference between the sage on the stage and the guide on the side you know understanding how to best promote student learning is is a challenge but um, but one to which many people at Bristol have ridden magnificently. Um, we saw six examples, one from each faculty yesterday at a, at a university management team plenary around what, what kind of um, changes in people had made to their courses, you know, how they were managing them online. And I was struck by both the diversity of those examples and the really deep aspect of um, discipline specificity of it you know and if you're teaching this kind of thing here are the kinds of approaches that you'd use and the the surprises the one thing that you know that struck me was the the sense that it in some ways it's leveled that teacher student power differential because we're all learners in this current context and and i i saw um that was an early recommendation the University of Ulster made to their staff that I was really struck by. Be very upfront with your students about the fact that we're all learning how this is going to work best. And in fact, some of those people who gave the examples talk, talked about in week one of teaching, they did this and these things didn't go so well about it. But in week two, they did something different and they learned. So I think it's been a really, a really rapid process of adjusting. But there's still, there's still big areas. That, that are problematic for, for our staff and students around um, certain types of practices that aren't well supported by the, the, our sort of default technology set and all sorts of issues. I think everyone's concerned to make sure that, um, that students, as many students as possible, are able to access and engage and, and that we have ways of spotting students who are struggling or feeling really underconfident or are a bit lost when, we, when we, we don't have those those facial cues, those, those body language cues to spot, spot the students who are struggling. 
Guys, that's that again. That was that was extraordinarily um, thorough and helpful. And, and I think, and, and I'm pleased you you mentioned it, Sarah. We did, of course, have a university management team plenary yesterday, and there were some extraordinary examples of of innovation that, by definition, have, have taken place over again um, a quite a staggeringly short time frame um, that has been forced upon us by this pandemic. And 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 it's wonderful that you had the opportunity to 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 recognise that and that we understand uh, the uh, huge efforts that staff have made to bring this material to our students um, online. So I, I'm now going to be slightly naughty and, and ask you both to name what you think the two biggest challenges will be looking forward based on, on, on what you both know as experts in the field. I'll, I'll kick off with Richard. Thanks, John. Um... I think the, the, the one major one uh, for me, which is what I'm currently involved in looking at, will be the, the extent of the relationship between our universities uh, and the edutech sector. Um, what's interesting is uh, when, you, when you look at um, current trends with regards to edtech, we see that just in the context of uh, venture capital investment, we've seen a three billion uh, dollar uplift in that just in the first quarter of the 2020 financial year which is the equivalent of 10% of the preceding decade. Um, we're also seeing a lot of the edtech ed tech organizations now obviously providing their uh, wares, if you can call them that, for free. Um, in part as acts of good gesture, uh, you know, acts of goodwill, um, but also one would speculate in terms of also demonstrating their capability. Um, and it will be very interesting, I think, to uh, begin to uh, track and understand the extent to which universities now begin to uh, immerse themselves in partnerships and some of those academic public partnerships, the three Ps, uh, with ed tech providers. Um, and that's perhaps especially going to be interesting to, to look at in the UK context, where we have such a, a highly developed ed tech sector. Um, uh, and to begin to see uh, in a long-term way what the investment in terms of uh, the kind of technological provision and the platforms that those ed tech providers can provide. In terms of um, providing long-term uh, um, quality products for, and dare I say quality products, but for, for universities, but also to begin to understand the way with which those partnerships might also assuage a lot around uh, existing especially amongst prospective uh, higher education applicants with regards to the quality of our higher education provision. The, the, the relationship between universities and, and the uh, ed tech sector has not been an easy one. Um, we've seen high profile cases across, the, especially in the course of the last 20 years, of uh, major and prestigious universities uh, getting into relationships with ed tech providers that, that haven't quite panned out and have been high cost failures ultimately. So it'll be very interesting to see the nature uh, with which uh, an investment in terms of that partnership might produce more fruitful results uh, and certainly could be used in such ways that will assuage those prospective applicants uh, and indeed those current students looking towards their uh, start in the new academic session uh, who are now beginning to doubt whether or not they should follow through on their university yeah. education, whether or not that relationship will assuage their fears where we are able to show the quality of the product. Um, so again, it'd be interesting to see the extent, John, uh, of the trends uh, and the different approaches across the sector of those who might adopt more of an in-house approach to yeah. the quality of their product versus those that might be more involved in procuring the external services of the ed tech sector. Uh, that's fascinating. Yeah, uh, uh, and a great, great point. Um, uh, so Sarah, um, what are your thoughts on the the big challenges then for the next 12 months plus? Well, in a way, Rich has already outlined some of the big challenges facing, facing me and my role. I think my, my sites at the moment are set on uh, kind of a lot of the really pragmatic stuff. Um, I think coming or, or supporting our academic staff to come up with a model of teaching that, that, that can swing between fully online, you know, some face-to-face -face and increasingly face-to-face -face as we, we hopefully, uh, you know, get back to normal, working out what, if any, of our estate we can use in a socially distanced or physically distanced way. Um, 
so those those are the the, the immediate challenges and i think um i think still understanding that 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 question about the the kind of online or predominantly online and uh, blended uh, models of teaching that work for bristol that work for bristol staff and bristol students um because uh, certainly i'm i'm aware in, in discussions with we, we've been talking to some of our our biggest uh pgt uh, masters courses that, that attract a lot of international students about how the, how they can best design to to meet the needs of that cohort who who may of course not be coming to to, to Bristol this year um, and I think yeah the classic classic designs of, of online online courses perhaps aren't aren't what we're looking for there we're, we're looking for something different something um, quite sort of high touch in terms of, of giving access to, to, to our academics and, and their research but I think so in the 12 months plus it's for me I think the question is what do we take from all of this that we want to keep and, and what do we throw away you know and I, and yeah. so for me obviously we wouldn't have wished this on anyone and uh, and I was actually having quite a nice digital holiday before this kicked off in terms of you know my focus had been on kind of curriculum framework and and curriculum in enhancement in a much broader sense but it it is you know it will have given st staff experience of, of teaching in many different ways and probably framing relationships with students in different ways and and looking at as Richard was saying earlier how different aspects of, of the student journey and, and pastoral and pedagogical relationships and development are supported uh, and that hopefully that will that will support academic teams in in thinking through what they're doing you know with their mm -hmm. curriculum design with that with their teaching yeah. and yeah. and uh, you know the, the the ideal is to enable them to focus their efforts where it has the most benefit for the student yeah I, i'm really struck by what by what you've both said um and and i think you've encapsulated something which i i don't think i've grasped before that if we think back a year we had this dichotomy of uh if you like um online courses which were created to be online and we had our traditional means of teaching, which involved students who would come to lectures and would attend tutorials and the rest. And of course, um, what we're trying to do now is to create something that is actually novel. It's, it's not actually a switch to online. I know people use the term blended learning, but of course, blended learning won't be the same for every institution. And we have to find our way to get the right combination uh, of uh, components delivered in the correct way to deliver the Bristol experience and, and the, the quality that we would expect um, to all of our students. And, and, uh, and I, I see that, that it's not just the same as having an online course. In fact, it's very different. On that note, I think it would probably be a good time to stop. It's been really fascinating discussing this with you both this afternoon. So Richard and Sarah, could I thank you very much for giving your time? I know that you're both extremely, well, we've just heard how extremely busy you are, but thank you very much for giving us the time to, to discuss this important series of issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.